Hi, my name is Ayab there, and I'm, um, uh, I wanted to corroborate something that uh, Joey said earlier when Neil was speaking about the how to make almost anything class. I can actually vouch that that class is the hardest thing I've ever had to get into. It was harder than getting into MIT. Um, but to be honest, that's a class that actually changed my life, so I'm really happy to be following that talk. So today I'm going to be talking about the internet as material. Um, I don't have to tell you guys, but the Internet of Things um, is a field that comes with a lot of promise. A lot of promise to make our lives easier, a lot of promise to get our thermostats talking to our fridges, preventing us from forgetting to buy milk, uh, and, and making our relationships better. But if you think about it, uh, many technologies and waves of technologies have also done the same thing, come with a lot of promise. In the 40s and 50s and 60s, when the first washing machines and dishwashers came about, it was all about this promise of how the technology was going to make your life easier. And yet, when we look at it, so many devices that are being created are being these closed, finished products that have functionality that has been prescribed and predefined, guessing what are the, what, how to make your life easier. A few days ago, I was reading um, uh, this, this Pew uh, study uh, about the Internet of Things, and this quote really caught my eye. Howard uh, Reingold says, we will live in a world where many things won't work and nobody will know how to fix them. And when I read that, I had two thoughts. Thought number one was, I hate to break it to you, but that's already happened. We already live in a world where many things don't work and we don't know how to fix them. In fact, when Hurricane Sandy happened, and I'm based in New York, when Hurricane Sandy happened, one of my friends who's a master's uh, uh, graduate in, uh, in computer science was asking me and couldn't understand why the lower part of Manhattan, after the hurricane had passed, why the lower part of Manhattan didn't have power, why the upper part of Manhattan had power. And there was this fundamental misunderstanding of how an electricity grid works and how power stations work that made me feel like we really reached a point where technology has become so far from us that we really don't understand it. The second thought I had um, was that part of the reason why this is happening is a lot of technologies are really sort of um, parachuted on us. So the TV industry is another example of a technology that came with a lot of promise. Um, and yet, I don't know about you guys, when I go to buy a TV, I have no idea what the difference is between 3D and 4D and 4K. And I have no idea what works. I just want something to display uh, pictures when I press it. But my, my other thought is also that it doesn't have to be that way, that we, I am optimistic, that we can change this, and we can make hardware and we can make the Internet of Things work in our favor and do what we want it to do and really improve our lives. Some, I don't have to convince this crowd. Some of society's most transformative technologies have started in the hands of experts. And then someone or something came along, democratized them, made them accessible to everyone, um, and they've really had a chance to transform society. Uh, a few years ago, I started working on this problem with a particular focus on hardware. So the way I look at hardware, how do we democratize hardware? Um, for me, there are these four principles, sorry about the uh, messy format. Lowering the barrier to understanding, lowering the barrier to iterating, making it universal, but also raising the ceiling of complexity. If you look at the left side, you have a raw circuit that's a proto-circuit or a breadboard circuit that is trying to have a function. Nobody wants that. Nobody is trying to make that. This is, a not an, this is a means to an end. On the right side, you have a device that is finished and polished and, and ready for you to use, but it's also closed and doesn't have a lot for you to integrate. And if I compare it to the world of software, on the left, uh, the proto-circuit feels to me like assembly code. It feels to me like really the very low-level um, uh, version of the hardware technology. And on the right side, it feels like an app, something that is finished, that you consume, that you interact with. But what is this middle? What is this modular approach to hardware that we can learn from software? What is the C++ for hardware? What is the object-oriented uh, version of hardware? So my uh, approach to it was, let's make hardware modular. Um, in early 2008, I started working on this problem. I actually went to purchase um, a modular uh, circuit, and I couldn't find anything, so I decided to start working on it myself, and started to create these circuits that were modular, that each had one single function. It was a very delicate balance between creating enough to, uh, functionality in the hardware so that it's meaningful, but also making it small enough so that you, can create, you don't have to constrain what people are trying to do with it. So this circuit is a cardboard circuit with copper tape on it that's creating a sound recorder. Another circuit, which is a battery, this idea that not every time you want to create something that is battery-powered, you have to reinvent how battery distributes power. 
And I started to experiment in different ways, and there, this took many years, this was early 2008, to really think about how to create a system that was really modular, but also very easy to use and iterate with. So this is later versions of how you have magnets that are snapping modules together, creating something very simple, in this case, a dimmer with an LED. Pressure sensor as well. About 20 Eight or 29 uh, prototypes later, and three and a half years later, this is what the library looks like. It's a library of these electronic modules that each have some very simple and some very, very complex functions, but they all work within the same system to really make this iteration with hardware very easy. And the mission here and the goal is to put the power of electronics in the hands of everyone. So I won't go through all these details, but on the left side, you see the raw, a raw circuit that's really breadboarded with wires, hundreds of components. On the right side, a finished product. So what if we inject something in between? In this case, a seven-segment display that is displaying a number, which is what you want to do is you want to see a number. You don't care about how the circuit is made, particularly if you're not an engineer. And for me, this is sort of the middle ground, the, the, the C++ version of it. So I'll show you a little video. So the concept is simple, but the execution is actually pretty difficult. For you to, ahead of time, think of all the possible circuits that somebody might come up with is actually a very complex task. And also, manufacturing is, uh, is not an easy thing um, uh, to figure out. But it's a worthwhile challenge, because it empowers people in a way that we've never even imagined possible. Today, uh, the Little Bits library contains close to si uh, sorry, this is Little Bits. I wanted I should have said, um, but today the Little Bits library contains close to 60 modules, and there's another uh, about 40 on the way, and makes it a really extensive, very powerful, but also very easy to use modular hardware library that really enables people with zero experience in engineering whatsoever to create highly complex behaviors in electronics. There are trillions of billions of different combinations of circuits that you can make, and that means a freedom, a freedom to people to not have to hire an engineer, not have to know exactly what is the outcome of what you wanted to do when you set out to make a project, and really be able to sketch. And the, uh, the key thing as well is for it to still enable complexity. Raising the ceiling as complexity is important. This is, like Neil uh, said earlier, um, it, uh, it, these are not toys. It's, it's about a tool to, to empower people. So on the left side, you see an example of a wireless communication device, where somebody says, I want two things to communicate wirelessly. On the left side, you, say, you see something that could take days to prototype, hundreds of dollars and hundreds of, of components, and so, many, so much room for error, when all you want to do was, is to have two things communicate wirelessly. So what, what, uh, what the idea is to make it into these modules. These are some examples of projects people have done. In this case, we have a, um, uh, a mounting um, system for an iPhone so that you can basically create um, this mount and, and, and take video, essentially, in a really easy way and consistent way. That's done by an industrial designer. In this case, it's a water cooler in our office. It's a very slow water cooler for people don't want to stand and wait for it to fill water. So there's a timer that stops uh, filling the water when it's ready. Here in this case, we have this wireless um, light fixture uh, that allows you to put a spot wherever you want it and allows you to dim and rotate in different ways. Again, made by a designer who's never had experience in electronics. This is one of the videos from our community members um, and is our version of Button Dolly, but a little bit more functional, um, that picks up, uh, picks up a, a, pick and a, a component and puts it back. And here um, is a robot that's basically delivering, um, uh, delivering um, a screwdriver uh, across, across the office, wirelessly controlled, and we call it the FaceTime robot. So you see, these are things uh, that took anywhere from minutes to hours to do, but we're not talking about days. We're not talking about experience, because sometimes you want to do something simple. <laughs> This is one of our team members, Andrew, who's pretty lazy. He doesn't want to go to the, uh, to the bathroom and then discover that it's used. So he made this little device where uh, you can tell whether or not the bathroom is in use uh, without having to go all the way there. But this actually illustrates, it's a funny project, but it illustrates an idea that I think is very important. Um, Part of the problem with having all the technology, particularly in hardware, sitting in the hands of experts and of companies is they're going to guess uh, what are the needs that you have. And there has to be a certain critical mass of these needs for a product to warrant existence. Sometimes you need to know whether somebody is in the bathroom. And that is a need that maybe only you have in the world. And that doesn't mean that the product should not exist. 
it doesn't warrant it also existing and having mass manufacture, et cetera, but it's a product with an audience of one, and that doesn't mean it's any less important than any other uh, things that you might use. These are some other examples. I won't go through all of them where we, created, we took a synthesizer, we broke it down into its parts, and so one of our community members made this huge instrument uh, made with Lego, with little bit sensors, and with synth bits to make basically an instrument um, uh, that is mechanical. And so the blurring the line between what is art, what is technology, is something that is really important because we want to make those tools really available to people without having necessarily a function, a, a startup in mind, uh, something that needs to be funded. Sometimes you will just want to make art, and art uh, wants to use the technology of the day. In this case, it's electronics. So I won't go through all of this. So one of the focuses that we're having is just enabling more makers, designers, prototypers, trying to give people that sometimes have uh, extensive experience in hardware and electronics but want to cut down their prototyping time and not have to reinvent the wheel every time. And, f and on the other side of the spectrum, people who have no experience at all but still want to make powerful, modern, and computational things. So going back to the Internet of Things and how that's relevant, I see a lot of these devices uh, that people are putting out, that there are these finished products coming up with these prescribed solutions to solve a problem. But I also see a problem where there's so much overkill happening. Every one of these devices, not everyone, of course, a lot of these devices um, are individual computers. Why should a temperature sensor that you're putting at home be a computer? Why should a, 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 pneumatic, a, a switch that you're trying to find out if your door is open, why should that be a computer? Why are we putting so much computational power when all we need is computation? It's not necessary to put a computer uh, on these peripherals. Sometimes all we want is dumb sensors and dumb terminals and dumb displays that then plug into something that we've already built, which is the web. We've already built the internet. Are we going to rebuild it now in the physical world? I believe that you don't have to, that the idea is to create these entry points to the web. And so I go back to this um, idea, and Neil hasn't spoken about it today. My first interaction with the Internet of Things was learning about Internet Zero. Um, and this is uh, from one of the papers that Neil wrote um, a few years ago. Um, in the very beginning of this field, this idea of a really distributed open network of these sensors and terminals and, and sometimes dumb devices that are not computers that are enabling you to do different things. So the idea comes back as, can we make the internet a building block? Can it become a building block that is empowering people to invent with the internet the way you would invent with light, with sound, with cardboard, with paper, and really make it a material? And so I'll leave you with this last video. This is the second sneak peek of this, uh, this thing that we're working on, um, where the internet is a cloud in the middle. You're creating an automated fish feeder every time. You swap it out, you put an MP3 player with a speaker, send a text message, now you've created your own wireless system for disseminating music. Swap out the MP3 player, put instead a servo, send an email to it, and now you've created your own nest. Kind of old school nest, but still. And then you put one in Tokyo and another in New York, um, and you embed it with other materials, like in this case, a plush toy. And in this case, we have Colin that's telling his daughter he loves her from across the, the world. And so the idea is that we want to sort of enable uh, people to create solutions that maybe are solutions for a problem of one person. Uh, they're a solution for people that are not going to make a product for them. And that's OK, and that's beautiful, and that's essential. And that's part of really democratizing hardware and democratizing the Internet of Things so that it's no longer like the TV industry, where you're sitting, consuming, hoping for the next ref to come, or uh, living at the mercy of a Best Buy uh, salesperson. So um, we're uh, looking for partners, people who have ideas, feedback, um, who want to work with us. So um, uh, I'm going to be here all day um, and would love to talk to you. Thank you very much.